Hello and welcome to the Sabbath School panel as we continue studying the Sabbath School quarterly titled Stewards in the Last Days, Part 1. This week we are studying Lesson 4, The Blessing of Work. But before we begin, let's have a word of prayer. Dear God, thank you for this day. Thank you for all of your blessings that you've given to us and uh, bless us now as we start this discussion and help us to uh, be able to uh, study this lesson well and bless our online viewers and forgive us our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Today on the panel, we have Brother Johnson, Brother Paul, and myself, Paloma. Before we begin the main lesson of the day, we are going to have a brief review of last week's lesson, Conquering Bad Tendencies, Part 2. If you would like to study along with us, you can find a digital copy by visiting sdrm.org slash publications. You can also find it on our mobile app through the Apple App Store or Google Play Store by simply searching for SDARM. Brother Johnson. Thank you. So today we are going to review the lesson that we studied earlier, Conquering Bad Tendencies, Part 2. The memory text here say, that's taken from Matthew chapter 13, verse 22, says, He also that received seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word. And the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word, and he becometh unfruitful. So if you remember about the parable that Jesus taught about the seeds that were sown on different ground, we see that this is talking about the one that fell among thorns and how much of a benefit it, uh, it was to the seed. Uh, it gets choked up. And at the same time, we see here, <coughs> We as uh, Christians, as uh, followers of Christ, if we were to take the word of God, but at the same time have the cares of this world and are we are deceitful or other things, eventually what, we, uh, what tends to happen is the bad tendencies seem to choke out the good tendencies that we may be learning. Mm -hmm. And uh, from testimonies for the church, it says, all money lovers will one day cry in bitter anguish. Oh, the deceitfulness of riches. I have sold my soul for money. For sure, we know to live in this world, we need money. We cannot live without money. Whether you want to get food or to uh, buy something that you need for your, uh, your basic necessities, you still need money. But here it's talking about money lovers. It's almost like they are idle. Everything they do is for the want of money. So money should be the means to fulfill things that are needed but it should not be our only goal. And as it says here, will one day cry in bitter anguish, oh, the deceitfulness of riches. So they were running after money in order to fulfill certain needs and later on it becomes certain wants and then it became certain um, uh, things that they were proud of and eventually money took over their entire life. And that's where it's deceitful. Um, and as we look into the section of uh, deception, uh, we see that like no one other than Solomon or even uh, David for that matter could have ever mentioned anything about the vanity or the deceitfulness of riches because they had whatever man could imagine. Actually, mm -hmm. Solomon even more than David. Yeah. Okay. Uh, whatever he could even imagine, whatever he could uh, dream about, he could get it because he had been blessed by such a large amount of wealth. But uh, when it talks about say, uh, how Satan perverts the heart, we see that um, in the example of Ananias and Sapphira, um, in the uh, time of the early church, people were uh, blessing those that were uh, suddenly left without money or because they had given everything for the cause of the church. They were helping one another, so they were selling whatever they had and they were helping those that were in need. But in the case of Ananias and Sapphira, the husband and wife, we see that uh, say it, it kind of started almost like with a good intention, but they also created more for the good words that they were praising, that the other believers were praising. They sold all these things and they were giving it to the church. And so they wanted to do the good thing, but at the same time, they wanted people to talk about them. Yeah, and I think that was showing a bigger problem because it's it's not like it was just a one-time thing yes. that, okay, this opportunity came up and they thought, wow, how I could have all this money to me. But that shows what was in the heart yes. because the Lord looks on the heart, not the outward appearance, but that shows that they 
you know, maybe they maybe they were giving some people were giving money to the church at that time because they everybody would look and say, look, did you see him hear how much brother so and so donated? And uh, they thought they could play both sides. Exactly. And unfortunately, they didn't give it to with the right motive, and the Lord didn't want didn't need their money anymore. But uh, uh, we have that shows when it shows Ananias and Sapphira's example. It's actually a good example for us because that shows that even though we might be doing good things, we might be studying our lessons. We might be coming to church, giving our tithe. That's not it. That's not enough for salvation. Yes. What we need is, as Johnson is mentioning in this, in this uh, key verse, some some of the the good, some of the bad things in this life, or maybe not, they're not even bad. They can choke out, uh, choke out the main, most important thing. And the most important thing we need to have is love for God and love for others. And we see here in the case of Ananias and Sapphira, it was immediate punishment. So what happened? Like um, uh, the re reason that it happened at that time when Peter uh, spoke to them was because it should not spread to others as well, saying that oh no one knows. Okay, so it was immediate punishment, and that was the end of it. But these days we don't have that immediate punishment, and that's why sometimes we think that oh we can get away with it. So and so is getting away with it. So why not me? So it tends to kind of encourage even those that are not deceitful naturally to think that. No one's going to know or, or, and it's not a big thing mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just going to do a little bit so we have to be very careful about that and if you look into the example of um, Jacob and Laban and how Laban was trying to um, change and try to trick uh, Jacob and God blessed Jacob every single time by increasing whatever he had so we see that God never le uh, lets the wicked to always uh, win yeah. But at the same time, we have to remember that God also permits sometimes the bad thing to go back and bite those that are doing it. So if you remember the proverb where it says that, as you sow, so shall you reap. So uh, here in Psalm, it says that um, in uh, chapter 7, verse 15, it says, He made a pit and digged it, and he's fallen into the ditch which he made. His mischief shall return upon his own head and his violent dealing shall come down upon his own plate. So we have to be very careful that maybe God gives us chance to repent. Mm -hmm. But if we are deceitful or if we are heading, uh, heading down the same path, eventually it will come back and haunt us for yeah. sure. Or not haunt us, but uh, it will come back and bite us and we will have to uh, uh, go through the consequences. Yeah, and I think we saw last week when we were studying this lesson that this lesson is not just when we'll see as we keep on going through the review, it's not just about money. Everyone has different tendencies that are maybe one point for me might be money, another point for you might be uh, might be just maybe, I'm not saying this is you, but maybe laziness or food or lust, whatever it is. Uh, we all have something that we have a tendency to lean more towards that. Maybe it's some of it's genetic, some of it's the way we're brought up. And if we are not careful with those tendencies, they can kind of overtake our lives. Oh, sure. So for everybody, it's different. Some people have a more tendency to drink. Some people have a greater tendency to do other things. So let's, I guess in our lives, we just have to individually reflect, like, what is my tendency mm -hmm. to sin? And then by God's grace, we have to uh, have a connection with Jesus, pray about that, and have him uh, give us the victory over that. Yes, thank you. And as we move on to this, the uh, subtitle here, dishonesty, we have to be very careful because uh, in any uh, walk of our life, we can be dishonest. Whether and here, is especially, it's talking about uh, those that are in business, those that are um, uh, taking care of financial transactions. Uh, how you can um, kind of misrepresent or try to twist whatever uh, what needs to be done so here it talks about misrepresentative misrepresenting motive and blackening the rep uh, reputation and even dissecting character it's not just only things to do with money like i, I it talked about how early uh, the J jews were very careful in their tithes and offering but in the other things that were more essential they were lacking so we may say that oh in uh, in business world i'm very very honest but what about being um, uh, one who that uh, bears tail or is susceptible to gossip and other things? Yeah, but what if it's true gossip? Is that wrong? 
it, it, gossip is gossip. It's not really your place to tell, even if it is true. Yeah. If you take it to the person first, to the person who is involved first mm-hmm. time, it's no longer gossip. But if it's true, but you take it to someone else, it's still gossip. And you're talking mm-hmm. about them. Yes. So moving on to this uh, next section on um, dishonesty, we see that it talks more about uh, uh, the reputation of others. And when we see here, it talks about how we could be rep- uh, misrepresenting the motive or blackening the reputation mm-hmm. or even dissecting ta- character. So. It doesn't always have to be with money and other things when we talk about dishonest, but it's about also tail bearing or gossiping about others. And uh, the other thing that uh, is also mentioned here is the spirit of gossip and tail bearing is one of Satan's special agencies to sow discord and strife, to separate friends and to undermine the faith of many in the truthfulness of our position. So. Knowing that it's one of Satan's special agencies, we should be very careful not to indulge in that at all. But as a natural tendency, it's, it just comes normal. Like if we, we think that we are doing them a good service, but at the same time, we are actually uh, assassinating their character, as it says. Um, one other point here in the next paragraph, it talks about how it is natural for human beings to speak sharp words. Mm. So I hope that we all make extra effort to, to try and train our tongue, yes, to make it unnatural. We, yes. And that's why um, in Proverbs, time and again, it's talking about how you can you can tame the whole body, but the little organ within our mouth is very hard to tame. Yeah, and I find it quite interesting. I didn't realize this until studying this lesson, but not only is it a problem speaking the sharp words, what happens when you speak sharp words? What happens when you speak unkind words? They lead to... Other things. other things. So when you speak unkind words, harsh words, what happens? Then you're quick to remember mistakes, quick to remember the errors of others. Yes. So it's like one thing leads to another. Like you tell one little lie, and you have to tell a bigger lie. To hide the other one. Yeah. And again, uh, one more point here. It says, often the seeds of distress are sown because one thinks that he ought to have been favored, but was not. And I think this is a very common thing. It's more misunderstanding. And also it's a pride matter. And um, this brings into an example of Lucifer. What else was the, the beginning of that struggle or that, uh, this, uh, that, that problem at that time? was because he thought that he was uh, not given the honor that was uh, meant for him. And moving on, when we talk about uh, really dishonesty in, in financial transactions, mm-hmm. it should, it, uh, for sure, people are dishonest in different things okay, in this world. And that's why in a company they do have auditors and also uh, they do have auditors from outside that come and audit the books to make sure everything is done. So do you think it's easy to uh, sometimes bribe them or to deceive them and hide things and um, kind of yeah really deceive these auditors to show that nothing is wrong? I don't think so. Sometimes it is because they are still human beings. Hmm. But here it talks about the account of every business, the detail of every transaction passed through the scrutiny of unseen auditors, agents of him who never compromises with injustice, never overlooks evil, never palliates wrong. It's talking about the angels. So I shouldn't worry about our human auditors or our human beings that are checking. But how is my, my, my name written in the book? Saying, was he dishonest and was he trying to hide things or what? So I hope that uh, we, uh, we always realize that God is watching over us. And we also know that if we gain something dishonestly, it never stays for long. Yeah. Okay. So in Proverbs 13, 11, it says, wealth gotten by vanity shall be diminished. Even though for some time it looks like it's prospering, it's increasing, but eventually, you know, it, and again, we also remember, uh, we can remember the verse that says, okay, wh- what good is it if you gain all the world, but you lose your soul? It's of no use. So yeah. I w- it's better for us to be poor in this earth, but rich in the, w- in the world to come. Okay. Moving on to injustice. Um, we are warned to avoid partiality uh, when we deal with others because when we are partial with one group or with another group, it automatically shows that we are not honest as well. Okay? 
because when someone comes to us, they they uh, believe that you are going to be um, unbiased and you are going to give, judge over them or give a report that is going to be the correct one. But uh, if we are it, it, if, uh, the thing that stood out here in Leviticus 19.15, it says, Ye shall do no unrighteousness in judgment. Thou shalt not respect the poor person of the poor, nor honor the person of the mighty. Mm -hmm. But in righteousness shalt thou judge thy neighbor. Sometimes people just feel pity for poor, uh, poor people, or they, they try to take sides sometimes. But you have to be just. Whatever is right is right. Whatever is wrong is wrong. Because... Uh, um, sometimes when they talk about even in these days, it's talking about even minorities, okay? Even if they are wrong, they, they mm -hmm. kind of excuse those things. But if you're going to judge over anything, you have to be just. And I think in, even in the workplace today, we have these laws and we have surveys. Uh, you have a survey of conflict of interest. Are you related to anyone who is a firm holder in this business? Do you own any stocks in this business? Mm -hmm. All those things. And uh, why? Why do we have those surveys or conflict of interest questionnaires? Because well, there should not be any partiality with how we're treated, why we work there, uh, things like that, who are hired, because we're supposed to have a, you know, a non-partial workplace and stuff like that. So even with others, we shouldn't be uh, partial with how we treat people. We shouldn't treat them better be because they're a friend, because they're a relative. That's what this is versus saying here in Leviticus 19.15. You know, we should be kind, treat everyone nicely and equally, fairly. Equally, yeah. And uh, again, time and again, we see the warning that's given where we have to defend the poor, the fatherless, and we have to do justice to the afflicted and needy and to deliver the poor and needy and rid them out of the hand of the wicked. So when we are in a position where we can speak out for them, sometimes those that are being afflicted, they cannot speak for themselves. We who can, who can, we should. And uh, one uh, particular quote that uh, comes to my mind was uh, given by uh, Edmund Burke, which says, the only thing necessary for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. I so heard that one. <laughs> if good men do nothing, automatically evil will triumph. Yeah. So, um, and again, uh, through the notes here, it also mentioned that we are held accountable and if the church also knows about uh, what is going on and it doesn't do, then the church also is held accountable as well. Yeah, it so, talks here in the last note how we should be helping others, helping those who are in need, who are sick, who are poor, you know, maybe helping in the local missions or doing some welfare funding, things like that. Yes. So we do uh, need to help all those uh, that are being uh, treated unjustly. And how about... Uh, being in the company. We all know we are social beings. We need company. And I remember always when I was uh, going to university, my dad used to tell me, be careful in who you choose as your friend. At that time, it didn't make much sense to me. Like, everyone is your friend, okay? You have to be friendly with everyone. Yeah. But uh, also, he used to tell me, uh, what, show me your friend and I'll tell you who you are, okay? Mm -hmm. so. It's not that you're automatically guilty by association, but once you associate with certain kind of friends, you tend to be like them. And uh, it's not that you have to kind of shun certain people, okay? But at the same time, if we gravitate towards those that are more studious, mm -hmm. more uh, religious in a, in a way, we also tend to be growing spiritually and intellectually. But at the same time, it talks about in, uh, in Proverbs 13, 20, it says, He that walketh with wise men shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. Yeah. So you just, it's okay to have some fun. But having fun all the time isn't going to be beneficial to you. So we have to be very prudent uh, in choosing our uh, companions. And we know even older brethren, they have experience firsthand. And they have gone through good times, bad times, easy times, difficult times. And their uh, experience and uh, their uh, uh, life will be a good uh, example for us and we can uh, learn a lot. So asking them is a good, a good thing as well. And just to point out, and I think what your father was telling you and what this is saying here is your close friends. So mm -hmm. 
be careful with your close friends because yes. as you mentioned we want to be friendly with everyone we know Jesus was sitting with the sinners and the publicans and the prostitutes mm -hmm. and the and the and the is of those times who was in a sense kind of a criminal because he was you know bypassing the legal laws and stealing but those shouldn't be our close friends but we still like you said we want to be yeah. friendly with them sure but not hanging out with him every week and yes. then late nights and, so. and that's why here in the end of the paragraph it says to walk in the counsel of the ungodly is the first step towards standing in the place of sinners and sitting in the seat of the scornful mm. so and in the council like not we shouldn't ask for their advice exactly or counsel so on life who matters. would you ask advice for you would ask to your parents yes sometimes to your church friends trusted adult yes mm -hmm. but how what do you mean trusted adult some well here it talks about uh seeking counsel from the wise okay but so someone who's respected maybe. but not just respected but, you yeah. have already tried Attention. and you know I can mm -hmm. trust the advice of such and such a person. You, that's why you said trusted adult. You trust them. How do you trust them? Because they have given you advice or they have advised other people that you know their counsel is good. Okay. Mm -hmm. So you try and test them. Mm -hmm. And also it mentions here that it is dangerous to be conversant with those, with those whose minds naturally take a low level. Okay. So again, some people you have to really stay away from. They are always looking for trouble. Hmm. But those that have little uh, in a wavering spirit, you have to be friendly so you can see if you can bring them close, close to the right side. But your close friends should be the ones that are more upright and they know good from the wrong. Okay. Amen. And so time and again, we sometimes tend to become desensitized. And that's a very dangerous that's the thing. Problem. Yeah. Um, it's a little thing. It's okay. And so and so is doing it. I'm not doing it. I'm not. But it's guilty by association again. Or you might get the thought that, oh, maybe if I act super friendly with them and go to these places with them, hang out with them, then maybe I can sort of pull them back. But that's... They will pull, pull yeah. you towards their side. Yeah. Okay? So just uh, to wrap up here about the futility of acquiring riches. So we already talked. We have several members uh, all that are rich. And again, uh, if you remember about um, even Nicodemus, he was quite wealthy at that time. And not only was uh, he wealthy, he was also well known. So he used his position and his money to help the church at that time of difficulty. And again, to help with um, the barrier of uh, Jesus Christ and so on. So wealth is needed, but that should not be the only goal. Exactly. Okay? And uh, it says about the warning where he says, His glory shall not descend after him. Okay, So you are you can earn everything but you're not going to be taking it with you okay and in matthew 16 26 it says for what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul so even those that are very poor in this earth it's very easy for them to get it down that's what uh, the, uh, even uh, uh, solomon mentioned about uh, even the, it's, it's very difficult for a rich man to enter into heaven but uh, a poor man it's very easy okay so um, yes the the having this uh, material benefits is useful we can help the uh, help the poor and the needy and it talks about how uh, um, how the, uh, these people are brought to us so that we can help them by the means that we have and you also mentioned about missions we have a lot of places where a lot more work needs to be done mm -hmm. but we should not be just craving after money. If we are craving after money to give it to others, it's a good thing because that money is not for us. It's Amen. for the Lord. So the whole order is about stewardship. So I hope that we learn time again that every little step will take us to, towards good company, towards being faithful, towards being honest, and towards giving to others those that are unfortunate as we see in this world now. Thank you, Brother Johnson. We will now move on into the main lesson of the day, the blessing of work. Brother Paul. So as uh, we were talking last week, how we can, in our, in our review lesson, how there are some things that can be deceitful, they can choke out the good things in our lives. We see that work is one of the things in our lives that is excellent, something that we need, it's essential. So Paloma, why do you need work? 
Well, for one, it keeps you from being idle. And you know, when you're being idle, that can be dangerous because your mind can wander, you can uh, become distracted and do things that aren't exactly good because you have nothing to do. That's true. How about you, Johnson? Why do you think work is essential? Well, we were not designed to be idle. Um, uh, for one, in this world, we need to earn money to, to live our life. And uh, we need to eat, we need to feed ourselves. So uh, to do and uh, or to meet all the necessities of this world, we need to work to earn money. But at the same time, it keeps us active as well because God has made, it's almost like a missionary. You have to do the regular maintenance and keep it running. Yeah. Where if you keep it running, it, it works even better than if you leave it idle for a long yeah. time. Yeah. I, I remember this uh, mowers and all your um, uh, lawn care uh, tools after after uh, the whole uh, season of winter and come spring, some of them they have a hard time starting up. So they were, they, they, but they once you work. start, once you start, it keeps on going till the end of season. So That's you true. know they are meant to be running. That's true. Yeah, great examples. Thank you all for sharing. And and our listeners out there, you can think yourselves, why is work essential? You know, the first thing that may come to mind is money. But I like that Johnson and Paloma didn't mention that right away. They were talking about other things. And work has a much bigger benefit than this benefit because it goes far beyond. We see that in the beginning when God created Adam and Eve, they didn't need money. They didn't need a car. You know, they could fly or they could run fast or whatever it was. Uh, but God gave us work because it's a blessing. Uh, I, I find many times working with people in healthcare that many times my patients, you know, Sometimes when they retire, I'm like, congrats, you know, how is it? Here and there, you have some people that are like, oh, it's great, I'm, I'm having such a good time, time, I'm so active. And some people, most of the time, though, they'll say, well, it's an adjustment. <laughs> it takes getting used to, or, uh, you know, I'm, I may be struggling. I, I think I need to find some, somewhere to volunteer, somebody told me. Um, someone said, you know, I'm thinking maybe I'm, I'm gonna go back to work. Why did I even quit? <laughs> So, many times we don't appreciate work, but work actually is a blessing to us. Mm -hmm. The nice thing is about work, what happens when you work a lot, hopefully not too much, hopefully we don't overwork, mm -hmm. we don't want to overdo anything, but what happens when you work a lot, when you come to rest, you enjoy the you rest, enjoy the rest appreciate much it. more because you worked. You're not sitting there anxious about, you know, I don't have much time to take a break, I need to go and do stuff soon yes so so it's so it's so cool to to have that and and then we can enjoy our rest we can enjoy our vacations more we can enjoy the beautiful things in life more by working but it doesn't mean we should overwork but let's look at some of the blessings in work uh, about work in our lesson and follow along with us at home if you have your lessons on page 25 lesson number five or as paloma mentioned on the uh, sdrm app so it says here in Genesis 2.15, And the Lord God took the man and put him into the Garden of Eden to dress it and to keep it. God gave him a responsibility. He gave him a chore. And us, as um, being part of the church, as church members, what is our responsibility? Every church member, every Christian, maybe We're you're not even a church member. First. Exactly. We're called to be missionaries. We're called to be workers for those who don't know about God, who don't know about the Lord. And not only in physical work, in uh, mental work, in all kinds of work, we can have a blessing. And Paloma, could you read us that note? And let's see what kind of blessing we have under the keynote. The true glory and joy of life are found only by the working men and women. Labor brings its own reward, and sweet is the rest that is purchased by the fatigue of a well-spent day. Wow, thank you. I don't know about most of you, I do look forward to um, hopefully working less and not weekends. overworking. I love weekends, I love vacations. But interestingly, this note is telling us that the true glory, true joy in life is only found by those who are working. So we already mentioned that God gave man uh, work at creation. And what was some of the responsibilities that Adam and Eve had to do back then? He was given stewardship over the garden, which basically meant, you know, taking care of the animals, I assume, naming mm -hmm. them, uh, taking care of the garden, 
maybe he still had to take care of the garden, just it probably wasn't as intense of a labor as it is now. Yeah, for sure. How about after the fall? The garden started producing weeds, mm -hmm. thorns. Did he just start hating it? And, and it wasn't as easy as it was uh, in the garden. It was not. In Much they, easier they, than today. They had to really toil, like we do now. We have to really work hard yeah. and you have to fertilize it. You have to till it and you have to, you know, like you said, keep weeding it. Yeah. And you have bugs to worry about and just and the so many things. But it. in the beginning, God was actually taking care of everything. Actually, the way he created it was perfect. Weed and control. they were just supposed to be training it, really, because yeah. they didn't have any other problems. But now it says that, and when as a result of his disobedience, he was driven from his beautiful home and forced to struggle with a stubborn soil to gain his daily bread, that very labor, although widely different from his pleasant occupation in the garden, was a safeguard against temptation and a source of happiness. So Yeah, that's interesting. It, it was compulsory for him to work after that. But he enjoyed it. He enjoyed it. And it was it was a blessing for him to keep him from temptation. I don't know if Adam and I don't I don't believe I don't know if we know, but I don't believe Adam and Eve ever sinned again after they were in this earth. So the Lord kept them. They were busy with work, and and um, I guess they were scarred so much from that first sin that they didn't do it again. But work is a blessing. We know that uh, there's a famous quote, and I think we read it later, that idleness is the devil's workshop. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if Adam and Eve were left idle, if they didn't have to do work, if they didn't have to raise the children, work in the garden, like Johnson said, toil the soil, I'm sure the devil would have been tempting them, and he was tempting them, but it would have been much easier for them to fall. And it is easier for us to fall when we don't have something to do. Uh, as a child, you usually want to, you, or a child, or um, you know, even little little pets, you want to keep them away from mischief because they can do it. You know, if children have matches around or a gun or something, you want to keep that out of the home. They can get into trouble. Also, wow! If you remember the experience of um, Cain, like whenever he looked towards the garden, he was always thinking that uh, God was so unjust to have driven his parents out mm. of the garden of Eden and how much they had to suffer just for one small sin. But at the same time, if you look at the experience of uh, Abel, he was looking on the positive side that God had promised and he kept them alive and he had promised a deliverer. So, uh, the Two, uh, two, two uh, young boys, but completely different it's uh, ideas or the way they looked at it. So, like you said, if, if they, I think it was because of idleness as well that you get to spend time thinking about wrong things or thinking Maybe. about bad things. Hopefully, yeah. Uh, I mean, you would think that their parents raised them the same. Yes, they were, but uh, how they spent, like Adam was, uh, was not the one that went closer to the uh, tree of the good of knowledge of Eve. But it was, uh, Eve, even after the warning not to stray away from Adam. So again, there Everyone are just so is many different. Things. Yeah, yeah, that's true. So we see here that work is a blessing. It's wise for us to work in Ecclesiastes, Solomon is telling us, and also that every man should eat and drink and enjoy the good of his labor. It is the gift of the God. After you do a nice project at work, after you, after you finish something, it feels good to sit back, look back, and enjoy it. And that's, that's even the thing. smallest fruit the garden produces. It's like, look a, at, look at a couple how tomatoes, much, a couple yeah, of grapes. Look at um, what my hard work has given. And yeah. Obviously, it's God's blessing, but it's like you, you have worked hard for it. It's that. more special. Yeah. You're right. That's true. All of you who have a garden or grow something, it's a great blessing. And even if you don't have, let's say you live in the city, you don't have room for a garden, you could have like one or two tomato plants in pots. Mm -hmm. And many of them, and, they and, even and enjoy have that as a blessing. little herbs uh, too. And sometimes some people have small plants in their, mm -hmm. uh, in their or even flowers. In yeah. yeah. So every little thing, when, when it blooms out, it's, it's a very joyful time. Yeah. So on to um, Monday on page 26. Not only was work given as a, uh, an option or a... Uh, activity for Adam and Eve to do, work was given as a command. Mm -hmm. And we found that in the Ten Commandments. The Israelites were given that, and the commandments were not only for the Israelites, they were for us today, too. So, how many days should we work? Six, Six. days a week. Six days a week. And should we do most of our work during those days? 
All of them. All of it. So yeah. there's a, unfortunately, I'm sure many of you have to-do lists. We can't get it all done as we would like, mm -hmm. but as long the Lord gives us enough grace to get the things that we need to do. So when it says all our work, all the necessary things. Yeah. So maybe if we have too many things on our to-do list, maybe we we have some things that are not necessary. But it's very uh, interesting here how the Lord is telling us it's just as important for us to be faithful and working mm -hmm. as it is to keep the Sabbath. Yes. We talk a lot about keeping the Sabbath. You know, we have to worship God on Sabbath. This is the day He gave us to honor Him. That's true. But at the same time, we worship God and we, uh, we obey His command when we uh, honor His command to work the other six days. So it doesn't mean that you have to have a job where you work six days a week. When it's saying work six days a week, what does that mean, Paloma? Working six days a week. It means basically doing anything. It's, like you said, it's not just uh, working at your job, but also doing things at home that need to yeah. get done. And all the things that you shouldn't do on Sabbath. Yeah. And it's interesting. And if you look at the note under 2A, it says the very best sermon you can preach to the world would be to show a decided reformation in your life and provide for your own family. The best sermon we can preach to the world, and maybe this issue is speaking to an individual, but one of the best sermons we can preach is by living a, a good, honest life and taking care of our family. And people will say, well, look how they take care of their family. Look how their yard is always neat and clean and all those things. Um, how do Christian stewards do their work? How well, should we do the, it as Christians? The verse uh, talks about doing it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men. And many times we uh, know or we, uh, we, we have heard how sometimes people do things, but they don't do it heartily, meaning they do it grudgingly. Half-heartedly. They, they, they complain. So it, they don't really enjoy what they have done. And if we ask someone to do something and they do it grudgingly, even we don't enjoy the work. Like it might have been done completely, but we, we, we don't see the quality in it. Yeah. So it has to be done as though it is done to the Lord and not unto men. Yeah, the Lord takes record of, of the little things. Maybe it's uh, something you're doing at work and you could bypass, you could cut corners, you could uh, maybe you're walking past a piece of trash or something and you just leave it there, kick it under the parking lot. Those little things, the Lord actually takes note. And uh, we remember that when Jesus, even when he resurrected, he, folded. he yeah, okay. folded his grave clothes. So when I wake up in the mornings, sometimes I remember I'm late for work and I think, how can I leave my bed unmade if Jesus, Jesus left his grave made? But you see, those are little uh, lessons for us. Uh, here in the second paragraph, it says, you are not to neglect the duty that lies directly in your pathway but you are to improve the little opportunities that open around you. Mm. So um, again, it's one thing uh, for you to tell someone to do versus for you to do. And uh, I remember about a uh, uh, thing that uh, one of uh, uh, my friends uh, mentioned that this, uh, the owner of this big chain of uh, grocery stores, when something spills in the, when he's in the store, he would not go and call the guy to come and clean it up. He wouldn't call a janitor. Hmm. He'd just go get the mop and he would clean it himself. Hmm. So he's a he's a owner. Okay? Mm -hmm. He doesn't need to do that. But by example, no work is beneath his his level. That's okay? excellent. So everything is important, and um, so we have to be very careful that when little opportunities open around, when when someone looks at it and say, if he can do it, why not me? Yeah. And if he keeps his surroundings clean and orderly, why not me? So you are leading by example, not by saying, do this and do that. You're and not it, ordering people. It works by leading when you lead by example, mm -hmm. because people are more likely to do it and his workers are more likely to do the little things that they remember, if they think, you know, hey, if the boss of the company is gonna mop and doesn't mind do that, I don't mind as well. And that also works like a sermon. You're not speaking, but it your does. actions and, speak louder than your words. It's true, research studies actually show that it works, um, just for example, like with doctors, if you, uh, doctors who, for example, um, like let's say in their doctor's office, they have, um, if let's say the patients pass by the doctor's office on the way to the room, and if they have like a bike helmet there, 
sitting there, something like that. Or, you know, like a green drink or something. You know, the patients are more likely to think like, the more patients are more likely to believe and listen to the doctor when they give them counsel about exercise or diet because they think like that doctor bikes to work. Mm -hmm. I see his bike helmet there. They did studies like that. And the doctor wasn't really biking, but they like, <laughs> so maybe one of them was or wasn't, but people didn't know. And they thought, you know, and he'd be like, yeah, and start exercising more. You can do biking and other things, you know, walking more. And the patient's like, oh, this doctor bikes and stuff like that. So if you, if we lead by example, as you said, it's much better than a sermon. Mm -hmm. Now, let's take a look here on to Monday, Monday C. I think this is something we often forget. Monday C, talking about first fruits, okay, under Proverbs 3 9. Obviously, we should work to be industrious, we should work diligently, we should work wholeheartedly. But what else do we need to think about when we think about stewardship? What does it mean, honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all that increase? What are the first fruits of our increase? We're not having any, I don't know about you, but I'm not, I mean, I'm not living off of like my fruits and vegetables. So I'm not going to give my first fruits to the Lord. I know back then in the olden times when the Jewish, the Israelites were, um, you know, a nation, they would give their first fruits of the cattle, first fruits of the sheep, of the the garden, the grapes. But what about today? What are our first fruits today? How do we honor the Lord with our first fruits today? Or do we, or should we, or is this something that we're forgetting about? Do you have any ideas of what this is talking about? Well, we have to. Uh, actually, uh, back in India, uh, even until recently, uh, what they were still doing was, those that, at least those that had gardens, they would bring it to the church and really? they would sort of auction it back to the church members. So the other church members, they would buy it and, they would give, and give it as an offering to them. So oh, they would give the money to the Lord? Give it back to the church. Okay? Oh, to the church. So, okay. it's, it, so I would bring, if I have tomatoes, I would bring it to, mm. uh, to the church. I, it's a, my gift to mm. the church. Okay. So the gig, And you would bring whatever you have and wow. everyone would bring their uh, own uh, produce from the farm or from their garden. And the church would auction it out. Mm. And now you would buy my tomatoes and you would pay the money that you auction, you bought it and give it to the church. So now it belongs to the church. And many times it becomes almost like you're not buying a tomato. Like, you know, tomato costs so much, okay? But you would pay five times, ten times more because it's for the Lord. It's, this is just like a token of sure. your ap appreciation. So at the end of the day, the church gets the money yes, and you get your produce. Fruits. So. It's, it gets exchanged and but that works if you have a like a farm or a well, yes, garden. Yes. But otherwise, no. But what I'm saying like it still works. We're practicing it. Yeah, that's good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I spoken with a few ministers, a couple ministers about this because I kind of grew up understanding that our first fruits was like the first check of the first job you got, and I didn't know if it was the first job that you got, the first check, or if you any other job you got. But um, when I spoke with uh, a couple of the ministers, actually one was a minister, one was Brother Gessner, who was our, who was our treasurer. Um, he mentioned, they mentioned that really they would give the first fruits once a year. So every year they would give the first fruits of that year mm -hmm. of their harvest for each harvest, like if it was the first fruit. So they would grow different things in each month, right? Maybe you grew grain in February, uh, apples in, you know, March and uh, grapes in, you know, May and figs in August, you know, so of the first fruits they would give from each crop. Um, but he says, you know, today it's different. So it was just a proposition that one thing you could do for the first fruits, you could give like one day, like your first day salary for each month. Instead of giving our first things, our first day salary from the, the month. I think that's a pretty, mm -hmm. pretty good idea because we give one day to the Lord that way. But just something, just some food for thought for us. We shouldn't forget about the first fruits. Yeah. Or like Johnson said, if we have a garden or something, we can maybe just give it for fellowship lunch, <laughs> the food. Um, onto the family firm. So we're talking about the blessing of work, right? How about teaching um, the children at a young age? So Johnson, you have children. Uh, I don't have any children. Paloma doesn't have any children. <laughs> we, we can't speak from personal experience, but how, how should it start? How should you teach them to be diligent in work? Well, from an early age, you can uh, train them. And as much as they are capable of doing it, you you train them, and you do not overtax them. As children, they 
but again, naturally they are also inclined to help. Like even with my daughter, um, even though she couldn't reach the sink, she would put a stool there and she would say, let me help you mom. Mm. And she would help. And when my uh, wife used to wash it, she would help to dry it. And okay, if you uh, use a dishwasher, she would help to take it from the dishwasher and put it back in the drawer. So things like that. And if you even look at the example of Samuel, Mm. he was not a uh, grown up man when he went to uh, help Eli. He was a little boy. And whatever at that age he could, like maybe getting water or whether he was uh, just doing a sweeping the floor or doing little things that Eli said. And even in the case of even uh, uh, angels that are not always busy doing that, even that wait on the Lord, they are also working. So uh, many times it's more, uh, um, um, how do you say, it's more about the willingness to do. So at that age, if they are able to help, as they grow older, they're even whatever. Younger. So basically, whatever they can do it at the youngest age. If you remember in the older times, things. it was like uh, like the ch- the family was working in, uh, or living in the farm. Mm-hmm. The little children took care of the little things. Okay, mostly the girls helped the mom to prepare food in the kitchen. The boys used to go together with the father to the farm. So it was a f- as the title says, the f- family firm. Yeah. So that that farm became a family firm. So it was everyone involved themselves into it. So really, when you think about it, uh, will the children naturally learn these things? Will children naturally learn to be diligent and helpful in the home? Sometimes by by observing, but not all the time. Sometimes, Mm -hmm. yes, by by looking at how uh, hard the mother and father works. They Sometimes, do. but not all the time. Not all so, the time. That's why we have to train them. You have to train them. So that's part B, Tuesday B. What does Proverbs 22, 6 say, Paloma? 22, 6? Yeah. I need to look at yours because okay. I don't have yours. Oh, yeah. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. So, sometimes Most yeah. habits are begin at a young age. Yeah. And they some of them, many of the good ones, we have to train them, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, we have to learn these habits. We have to uh, train the habit of, of doing diligent things, helping, helpful, being tidy, being clean, being uh, orderly. Yeah, all these things. Punctual yeah. and just so many things. And again, just a few things that was mentioned in the previous uh, section under A was about certain things that children, as they grow up, they can do by themselves. And it talks about how the mother should not wear herself out by doing things that children might do or should do. Mm-hmm. So after after a particular age, we didn't uh, give uh, our daughter a bath because she was capable of doing it herself. Mm. That's one less thing for you to worry about. She was able to dress herself. She was able to comb herself. So all those things now it kind of becomes automatic. You don't exactly. have to worry. So but when they are infant, you have to do everything you have from to train cleaning. Them. But, w- but what if they don't want to do it? Like, let's say you ask her to sweep the the floor and she says no. For Proverbs 22, 6. <laughs> Train up a child. Train in so the way we should go. So and when he is old, he will not depart So from training it. implies there is some practice. If you're training exactly. a horse, how, how many times do you train a horse to, uh, what is it called, to when break them in or something? It involves I mean, a lot of repetition. Yeah. Like with any type of training. Yeah, or dogs that go under training mm-hmm. for certain things. You don't just take them one time and they're trained, right? Mm-hmm. So same, rep- repetition, as Paloma mentioned. But what if, let's say, for example, okay, so we're talking about training them in in helping and being helpful. But what about training them in eating? What if they're what if they're naturally inclined to be a picky eater? I don't want that. I just want potato chips and cake and chocolate. Like do you think our ta- do you think we can help train the taste buds of young children in our taste buds? For sure. Yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we can. So that's another thing we should keep in mind. Um, not only should we be training children in, and we can even train ourselves to improve in many ways, because thank the Lord we can adapt. And these are all, uh, uh, what do you call that, uh, acquired. They're okay? acquired tastes. So yeah. like my taste habits. buds and my taste habits are different from yours. But how did that happen? Because I kept on liking certain things. Thing. So I like this. You kept exactly. on. So, um, Yes, sometimes children don't like certain things, but if you know it's healthy and it's good, you have to make sure that they try it first. 
Exactly, and try several times to acquire that taste. Maybe. And eventually, as they get older, they might end up changing their minds. But mind yeah, sometimes I have heard where, oh, my mom used to always uh, make, force me to eat this, and now I don't like it. So it's up to them after yeah. that, okay? Once they are grown up, once mm -hmm. they are adults, later on they will know what they have missed, okay? Mm -hmm. But you can force or you can train them only to a certain, uh, as long as the child is at an age to listen to you or obey you, it's your duty to bring them up in the right way. Exactly. In most cases, I think that training is going to have a benefit. Yes. And you look at people who go to the military. Uh, <laughs> Whether you like it or not, they have to. Yeah, they might not want to get up at 6 a.m. They might not want to, uh, you know, put their boots in order. They might not want to shine their boots. They might not want to do all this. They shave every morning, get up at this time. But after a while, whether Johnson said whether or not you like it, you have to. And I talk to some people like they say, you know, I was a Marine or something, and I just get up at four thirty, and they might be in their fifties or sixties. It becomes it's a habit. A habit yep. Yeah. So we should train the good habits and leave aside the negative tendencies that we were talking about in the review. And that's what the duty of the parent to uh, kind of reinforce the good habits and also try to, like they say, nip the. Wrong, wrong things in the bud. Yeah, right? so, so which is which is one of the wrong ones we need to nip in the bud. Like it's question C, idleness. Idleness. Even, even disobedience sometimes you have to make sure that they learn that it is good to obey. Yeah. N not that they must obey because we said something, but they should learn the benefit of obeying. And again, idleness the same thing. Why are you just sitting around? Why don't keep yourself active? That in itself is also a thing of obedience or disobedience. Yeah. And it's not that you as a parent or, or we want someone to always be working and always be doing this and that. But that's what we have to train these habits because if we don't train the habit of always being, of being frequently active, working regularly, we're going to end up being lazy. Mm -hmm. We're going to end up being idle. And what's going to happen if we're being lazy and idle? The devil is look at this note. What does that note under 3C say? What does it say, Paloma? When there... Where, where there isn't an abundance of idleness, Satan works with his temptations to spoil life and character. So we see if we're not doing something busy or active, Satan's going to try to come into our and lives nothing and gets done. get us into the wrong way. Yeah. So on to Wednesday. How important is rest? We talked about work. We've been focusing on work, staying active, the blessing of work, but I praise the Lord for the blessing of rest. And I praise the Lord for sleep and for Sabbath which is the day of rest. Um, not only is Sabbath a day where we can rest physically, but it's a day where we can rest mentally from the cares of this world and we can think about God because God is the one who gives us rest and peace. But um, here, so we're, Wednesday we're talking about improper rest. Uh, what is the counsel to those who do not obey the fourth commandment to work six days and they're trying to rest the other days? So it is good to rest, right? Mm -hmm. But what happens if we're resting all the days? Not all the days or too much of the time. Uh, the Bible tells us those people should be supported by the local uh, government uh, charities. It says mm -hmm. that if any would not work, neither should he eat. What? They shouldn't eat? But what are, are they going to starve? Well, they, that's why they got when, when you starve, it becomes a good motivation for you to do something to feed yourself yeah. the next time and again we cannot generalize mm -hmm. sometimes some people due to circumstances due to uh, like um, uh, misfortune or different yeah, things they're genuinely they cannot, unable okay? to uh, those we are there uh, we meaning as a church member as a christian as Community. a church we have to help those that yeah. like i was but, talking about last week yes and it uh, here it says that the lord does not require hard working man to support others in idleness because uh, I've uh, seen cases where the, there were people that had fallen into difficult times and they were having a, showing a sign that uh, they would work for food. And this guy came and asked what he did before he became kind of homeless or something and got him the tools to go and mm -hmm. work. And he was off the streets because now mm -hmm. instead of giving him food, he showed him how to work so, and that's all that was needed yeah. so now he is eating because of his own hard work so it doesn't mean that we shouldn't be helping those who need help we must uh, help we should we must help them it's a responsibility but as you said we should help them to try to get them to a better position where they can provide for themselves give them the tools to work and maybe some are physically not able to work and then that's fine maybe some are not 
mentally able to work, that's fine. The Lord understands those cases, but even if they can't physically or mentally work, if they're able to, they can do other things. Maybe they can, uh, you know, be a good help at home. Maybe they can help with volunteering somewhere or, uh, you know, doing some other things in the community. Mm -hmm. Because uh, one other thing that kind of uh, becomes like a hindrance or a drawback is that you see many younger men or sometimes even women who are uh, holding up signs and asking for money. But uh, I go to a store down the street and the lady looks like she's in her 80s or even older than 80 and she's there busy working. So there are some people that are really putting their effort to work and earn and to provide for themselves. And there are others that want to uh, take an easy ride. But again, we cannot generalize because yeah. they may have uh, difficulties that we don't know. Or but uh, to, but uh, we have to be ride. very prudent and we should be good stewards that we don't waste the church resources or our resources sure. on um, someone. I have heard even uh, experiences when one of the Bible workers said, oh, he saw someone that was asking for food. So he said, I have a job for you. Uh, and then once you do, it, I'll pay you. And he said, no, I don't want it. That means they just want the money. Hmm. So they would not work for it. So because yeah. um, it says the Lord does not require the hardworking man to support others in idleness. Hmm. When we remember this, we will not be just wasting our money. Yeah. Um, sometimes the, the sole bre uh, breadwinner of the family uh, has some health problems or pass away. Then yes, they, they have to be helped. But uh, those that can stand on their own feet, we should encourage and help them. How can we make your life better? Exactly. You, can, you can help only so much. Yeah, and I, we help ourselves by working because if we are resting too much, if we're not diligent, so it doesn't mean that we don't we have to work. If the Lord blesses us where we can financially not work, then we can do what with our time? We can work for the Lord. We can work for others. We can help our mm -hmm. neighbors. We can uh, make you know make bread once a week for other sisters or brethren in the in the, fan, in the church, or make soup for the soup kitchen once a week. Or we can do other diligent things in our lives, things to help others. Uh, but if we're not staying active physically and mentally. Yeah, we talk about these things here, you know, we can, we might not be able to provide for ourselves, but more than that, we can develop depression, we develop anxiety, suicidal thoughts. Uh, there's a lot of problems with it. And then, as we mentioned, the devil has an opportunity to get us more when we're, when we're idle. So there's a, work is such a blessing, occupying the mind in something useful is, is a safeguard to temptation. And the Lord gave us that. Uh, to help us, you know, not to fall into temptation, but also to be a benefit to us. And one other thing was that um, you can always be a blessing to others. And when you mentioned about those that were uh, retired, uh, many of them, they have retired from executive positions or some important positions. Yeah. And they can use those talents be, uh, uh, in a voluntary basis. Yeah. Okay? So I heard about uh, places where these executives, okay, like men and women, they they have been involved in different things and then they go and join this non-profit agency and they help them to fundraise and uh, help them in different different uh, uh, areas where they were expert so they are, they are not just sitting idle they, they they are still keeping their brains sharp and keeping themselves active by helping these other organizations and really i don't think this organization would be able to ever afford to uh, hire these people, but they were volunteering their time and uh, they are being a blessing to the organization and they are being a blessing to themselves by keeping themselves active. Exactly. Yeah. So we can encourage those who maybe are retired and are looking for something to do. Some of these suggestions that they can be, you know, help out local community organizations or other things, and they would be a great help to them to have someone so talented. And I just want to read this last note uh, under 4A. Because it has some good Bible verses. It says, whatever the line of work in which we engage, the word of God teaches us to be not slothful in business, fervent in spirit serving the Lord. So it's saying in business doesn't mean that we just have to, uh, you know, we we're talking before about money and stuff. Oh, the love of money. The love of money, yes, loving money is bad. But here at the same time, if we compare verses to verses, we see the Lord actually wants us to be diligent in our business. He wants us to 
uh, be good at our businesses. He wants us to be successful, not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Then it says, whatever that, whatsoever the hand find it to do, do it with thy might. Knowing that, the, that of the Lord he sh shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Jesus Christ. When we remember, at the end of the day, we are serving Jesus. Exactly. And he is our boss. Uh, and whatever we do, if we do it heartily as unto the Lord, with our whole might, I can guarantee you, you're going to be a success. You think about Joseph. He started as a slave working in Potiphar's household, but he did it well. He did it heartily for the Lord, not only for his master, but for the Lord. And he became ruler over his household very soon. The Lord blessed him. So on to Thursday. I actually was jumping ahead before I was talking about rest. I was getting so excited about rest. <laughs> but now we're talking about the rest. So his rest. The Lord, after making man, making Adam and Eve, he decided to rest. He decided to give himself rest. He decided to give you rest. He decided to give me rest. He decided to give us all rest. One day of rest per week. Every week. Isn't that such a blessing? Because God knows work is good for us, but he also knows we need a rest. And it's a rest from our labor, but it's also a day that we can honor and worship our Creator and come closer to Him. A day where we can come closer to family, a day where we can enjoy nature and, and the beauty that He has made. So when was this uh, rest was, was given to us? The Sabbath day was given when God ended His work. God ended His work which He had made and He rested the seventh day. Moss work which he had created and made. Was this just for the Jews? No. This was for all. For all. But it just says uh, it was made for man. It doesn't say about women. Well, man actually mankind. talks about both man and woman. Yes, uh, mankind. exactly. So when it says in the beginning, you know, uh, I believe, I forgot what it says. In, in Genesis, it talks about, and God took the man and placed him in the Garden of Eden. When he says that, he took Adam and Eve. So same here. He said unto, unto what? How do we know it's not for women? He said unto them. And uh, one other thing when he talks about he rested on the seventh day. Really he didn't need rest. Mm -hmm. okay? Because by the word, by the power of his word everything was done. Okay? The only thing really he did was create man physically. Mm -hmm. And again he is God. Okay? Yeah. But by example, didn't get tired from yeah, that. by example he was asking man to enjoy the rest, take rest. Um, yes. Because he knew that we, again, if you, if you think about it, there are times when, like you said, we don't finish all the things on our to-do list and we are ready to go and finish it. Okay. Yeah. So if we were given the opportunity, we would be working seven days a week and we would just burn ourselves down and we would be just so exhausted. And God doesn't want us to uh, do that. That's why he talks about improper rest because there is a rest. And there is an improper rest and there is his rest mm. okay so uh, in his rest we get a time to contemplate on um, again what did they do uh, on that day of rest they enjoyed his creation mm -hmm. yeah i see your point i mean for us it makes sense that we have the rest because we need it and we can overwork and we won't be able to finish our to-do list but <laughs> adam and eve they didn't maybe i don't think they were that busy yeah. i mean actually i mean i don't know but they were probably pretty busy but at the same time, I don't think they were tired from it. You know what I mean? But like, was... we're tired from our work. We're tired from our school. We want the break. But do you think, like, I mean, do you think they needed, do you think they needed the Sabbath like that, too? The Sabbath was for them a delight to see what God has created. And again, if you look at it from another point of view, the six days they were doing the same thing. They were enjoying His creation as well. But they were, like you said, they were training the plants, you know, maybe naming the animals. Mm -hmm. Now, instead of naming the animals, training the plants, picking the grapes, they could sit back, relax, and they could, it was more reflective now. And one mm -hmm. other thing also. Uh, like, and maybe it's probably spending time more with, more with God. Exactly. Spending all, you know, you have the whole day, they had the whole day to spend with God instead of, you know, in the evenings of the cool of the day. And for us, I would look at it as uh, like a tithe. You give the one tenth of your uh, earning to God, and the same way you get you give one, one seven, okay, one part from the seven days to God. Mm -hmm. And then when you look at it as though it's a, it's a tithe that you return to the Lord, you would not try to take something so you can do your own work. Yeah, that's true. So, um, 
It's interesting that God set the set apart the seventh day as a day of rest, and He blessed it. It says in Genesis chapter two, verse three, that the Lord blessed the Sabbath day. And uh, how do we know that it wasn't changed to a different day? It was never specified. Never specified. Or that it was in Mark, uh, even the New Testament, it talks about how the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. So it's kind of reiterating still that here there was no change. And said, we still had the Sabbath made for us. Yeah, therefore the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. So, And also Jesus Christ also kept the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Nothing and changed. It's true. And um, we know that there was no Jews in Adam's time. It was just Adam and Eve. So it was made for man in the beginning. It was given to the Jews later on. We read in Mark that it was made for man. God is the Lord of the Sabbath. And we see if God said that he blessed the seventh day and hallowed it in Genesis chapter 2, um, we find in Numbers 23, 19, I just want to read this verse, one of my favorite verses. Actually, Numbers 23, 19 and 20, it says, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. Has he said, and will he not do it? Or has he spoken, and will he not make it good? Here it is. Behold, I have received a command to bless. He has blessed, and I cannot reverse it. So if God bless something, we as man, we cannot reverse the day that God has given us. We can't decide, you know, hey, I want to, I mean, my job is offering me to work on Sabbath. I'm going to make, you know, more money because it's the weekend. I get the weekend pay. I think I'm going to work on Sabbath because, uh, because I want to, and I make more, a little more money, and uh, I'm going to rest another day. Can we do that? Not if God said so. You know, some people, and this may be personal, uh, but some people in the medical field may think that it's okay to work on Sabbath. And in a sense it is, because Jesus went about what doing what on the Sabbath day? He went about healing. doing good. Healing. He went about healing. So yes, if you're doing good, if you're healing, yes. But if you have the opportunity where you can save that day, the special day, that is the best because... God specifically said one day, this day, the seventh day, as a special day for him. And the Lord calls it my Sabbaths or my rest. It's God's day of rest, and he wants us to spend the day with him. We see that it was a sign. It was a sign between the children of Israel under part B. So how do you prepare for what the Lord calls, calls my Sabbaths, my rest? Um, the Lord says in, in Exodus 31, 13, you know, speak thou unto the children of Israel, verily saying, My Sabbath you shall keep, for it is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that ye may know that I am the Lord that sanctify you. So here we see that the Sabbath is God's sign, it's God's seal, that um, He is our God, He is our Creator. And, he, and we are His Sabbath keepers. Yes, we're His people. And He sanctifies us or makes us holy through keeping the Sabbath day. And in, in Hebrews again, it mentions that this is it's his day of rest. Uh, specifically, it's giving us the verses in Mark and Luke to understand how we know which day is the Sabbath and what we should do. And briefly, it's kind of touching on what we should do on Sabbath, what we should not do on Sabbath. So in Luke, it's talking about, what was it talking about in Luke chapter 23? What is that chapter about? It's talking about there in the verses that... Oh, about the preparation. It was the preparation in the Sabbath of Iran. Yes, so this was around the time of Christ's crucifixion. This is talking about the women were going to, uh, wanting to anoint Jesus. So we know Jesus was taken down on the preparation day. They had to break the legs of the thieves, uh, of the thieves because they, wanted, they didn't want them to be hanging on the Sabbath on the cross. And they were not dead yet. And they were not dead yet. So they had to break their legs to get them down so they wouldn't be breaking the Sabbath, hanging on the cross. And then Jesus, we know, was dead. They stuck a spear in his side. They confirmed that. And it says that it was that day, the day of the crucifixion, was the preparation day. So we know that the Jews keep the Sabbath. So the preparation day before the Sabbath, or Shabbat, is Friday. Mm -hmm. And did the women, couldn't the women anoint Jesus, the king of the universe, on the Sabbath? That would have been Even a good time was, and a good It would have been a, I mean, I don't know, I might have been tempted to, or I don't know if it would have been wrong, honestly. 
Well, but they kept it. I don't think it's wrong. Would have been wrong to anoint him, do you? Well, mm-hmm. but as it talks about, so when you give, when you make certain exceptions or excuses, we may say these things are okay, these things are not. And even in, when they were building the, the sanctuary, okay, we were, um, building the temple, mm-hmm. you, like so many things were so meticulously done that there was no noise made at the place where they were building the temple. Everything was cut and hewn where they were uh, uh, taken out of the corner. And they stopped. And when they brought it, it was just quiet. And again, they were uh, they stopped for Sabbath as well. But they were building the uh, temple of God. They could have worked. You're right. Again, They're saying it's God's house. Yeah. But it would have become an excuse. Mm. Oh, I'm doing the Lord's. I'm okay. doing this for the Lord. And so time yeah. and again, we might make excuses. But when you're doing certain things, and again, now... Um, uh, you, you you can uh, think about it even for yourself. Yes, Jesus healed and Jesus also for our preached and so on. Yeah. But when you are doing even good, do you have enough time to contemplate upon the blessing of Sabbath? You're you know, busy so you're doing saying, things. Yeah, you're saying we don't want to do even too many good things exactly. that we don't have time to if contemplate you can the creator. Wait, uh, put it for later, you can. And it was right. the opportunity, maybe Christ only, you know, he had that opportunity on the Sabbath. Also, Christ knew that the Jews thought it was wrong to do good on the Sabbath, so he had purposes. And it, uh, he was using that also as a teaching experience for yes. them because they... For them and for the disciples. For human beings, us. they would not uh, care, okay? Those that were leprous and those that were sick, they did not uh, worry too much about them. But if their cattle would fall by the Kalan... They would go and help it out because that's why he asked them, would you leave it there till Sabbath ends? No. So isn't the children of God, meaning human beings, more valuable than the animals? So he's showing us what's good and what's... It was a uh, learning, learning experience, experience yes. and a teaching opportunity for him Yeah. at that time. So we see that the women, uh, what do they do on Friday under verse 56? On the preparation day, what do they do? It says they returned and they what? Prepared spices and ointments. So they did the preparation on the preparation day. Day. On the Sabbath, they were not preparing. And rested the Sabbath day according to the commandment. So it's kind of underlined that that according to the commandment, they rested. And that's why they went there immediately after to go and uh, 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 kind of uh, take the uh, spices and ointments there. And I think that's where they didn't find him anymore. Yeah, you're right. So this is a teaching point for us. See, the Bible specifically, every word in God's word is uh, is holy mm-hmm. and it has a purpose. It's for us. So if the Bible is telling us this, it's for us to learn. Maybe it would not have been wrong for them to anoint Jesus on Sabbath. But we are le- to learn from this. What can we learn from this? That all of our preparation should be done before when possible. I mean, let's say it happened something in the last minute on Friday, on Sabbath, and you can't do something, you know, maybe you have to buy a medicine or you have to buy uh, some food or water for someone who's thirsty or drowning or starving or whatever, right? That's okay, but if you can do something ahead of time, if you can do something on the preparation, that's what, we should, what should be done. That's what it's demonstrating here. It should be done with time as well, not rushing and being like, oh, Not in the last minute, yeah. So the women did it on the night. preparation. They would have had, a, they could have had mm-hmm. an excuse to even prepare the spices in, on the Sabbath day, but they didn't. Yeah. So that's what it's saying here in the note. What is the first sentence of the note? Talk to us here uh, a little bit more, Paloma, about the preparation. If you could read some of those things. I mean, actually... You mean the, the just, beginning of the note? Or yeah, you just, just read the whole, the whole note. Okay. Good. So under B? Yeah. On Friday, let the preparation for the Sabbath be completed. See that all the clothing is in readiness and that all the cooking is done. Let the boots be blacked and the baths be taken. It is, impo- it is possible to do this. If you make a rule, you can do it. The Sabbath is not to be given to the repairing of garments, to the cooking of food, to pleasure seeking, or to any other worldly employment. Before the setting of the sun, let all secular work be laid aside and all secular papers be put out of sight. Parents, explain your work and its purpose to your children and let them share in your preparation to keep the Sabbath according to the commandment. Thank you. So I think we can learn from this that the things that can be done ahead of time should be done ahead of time. She must gives, be. Must be. Yeah. They, yeah, exactly. So she gives us examples that we, sh- we must do these things ahead of time. 
We should not leave them for the next day just because we're lazy or something. If the preparation can be done ahead, it should be done. And should the preparation just start on Friday afternoon? It should be as throughout the whole week. As soon as you close the Sabbath, yeah. you start again the next, for the next week. So the boots to shine the shoes, we don't have to wait till Friday afternoon. We can shine the shoes on Sabbath mm -hmm. night or Sunday. We can, we can uh, you know, shave Friday afternoon. We can do these other things ahead of time. Um, but plan out ahead of time so when it comes to the Sabbath hours, we can lay our papers aside, lay everything aside, get these things out of our mind, and, and really enjoy the Sabbath of rest, God's rest. That's why it says if you make it a rule, you can do it. So it's when we try to make excuses. And again, when you give some of those examples, uh, we can, it's, it's not bad to do. But when we, it's when we give, make excuses, it kind of, uh, we tend to make uh, them as a rule that it's okay to do these, these things because it's, it's important. But if we, if, okay, if we need to go and get somewhere, the, someone uh, gave me an advice saying that uh, the, the tank, the gas tank in the car is always full on mm -hmm. Fridays. Mm -hmm. Okay, because you never know. Because I live close by, so I don't need uh, that much of gas. You might think but, I can go on but, an empty tank. To but church. what, what, if, what if something happens? Okay, yeah. there's an emergency or there is something that needs to be done. So if you are on a full tank, you don't have to worry about That's it. That's true. Okay, so water. Something if you, you have can water, do ahead of time. You, you, there should be extra preparation. That okay, when you go on a hike, you don't expect a bear to come after you. But we do take precautions. You have things that you need, okay? Mm -hmm. And you don't think that you're going to go on a hike or a uh, backpacking trip for um, two months or so. But you take the, the necessary supplies with you. So when we are able to make those preparations mm -hmm. for those things, why not on these things that we know will not happen, but we are preparing for the Sabbath day? So we will not be caught unaware, okay? Yeah, that's true. Yeah, thank you for sharing. So the Lord is trying to teach us, yes, to be diligent in our preparation uh, for the Sabbath so we can enjoy His day of rest more and not be rushed, not be stressed. We can come into the rest that He wants to truly give us. And that's what we were seeing in this lesson, that this lesson talks about how we can not only work ourselves every day, uh, we can teach those around us to work and be diligent in what they do. And that way they can receive the blessing. Work is a blessing. And then when we work diligently, we can enjoy the rest more. And we're going to not only have a physical blessing, it said we can have physical joy here, physical happiness here. But for those who keep that commandment, the fourth commandment, to work six days or be diligent, do something diligent six days of the week and rest seventh day, if we keep that commandment along with God's other commandments, God will give us not only a Sabbath of rest here every week, but He's going to give us Sabbaths for eternity. He's going to give us heaven above, which will be to us a rest, right? That's going to be coming into His rest. So I hope and pray that each and every one of us can take the opportunity to be diligent, do things well, do things hardly as unto the Lord, do things with all of our might, all of our strength, whatever we do, and that we can come closer to the Lord. This is my prayer. Amen. Amen. So let us now bow for a closing prayer, our heads. Dear Lord, we thank you for this day. We thank you for our online listeners. We pray that you will be with them and bless them and help them, dear Lord. Help us as well to keep your commandment of being diligent and laboring each of the six days of the week as to the Lord, not to man. We pray, dear Lord, that you will bless us, give us strength, give us health, and help us also to enjoy the wonderful rest that you've given us every Sabbath day. This is our prayer and our desire. We pray that you will help us all, dear Lord, to one day be able to see you above and celebrate that first Sabbath with you in heaven. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We want to thank you for joining us today. Join us again next week as we study the lesson titled, Active and Capable. God bless.